Okay. So I think we're, uh, people are entering the, from the waiting room. Um, Emily, whenever you're ready. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, yeah, I think we can get started. Okay. So I want to thank everybody who is, uh, has been waiting and is entering the, the Zoom call now. My name is Leslie Martin, Creative Director at Aperture. Thank you for joining us. We've been trying over these last few weeks to find ways to keep connected to the photo community at large through IG Live, Zoom, just trying to understand what's going on through photography, through the community, and we appreciate your joining us. Um, today, I'm especially delighted to have Kathy Ryan as part of this ongoing series of conversations. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the amazing work that she has been shepherding over at the New York Times Magazine um, over the course. So thank you for joining us, Kathy. Um, for those of you who don't know Kathy, I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, she is the director of photography at the New York Times Magazine, where I think she has mastered the fine art of combining um, artistic photography, photojournalism, to create a hybrid that really animates the pages of that publication. Um, I think she's also someone who I believe has been a mentor to a fair percentage of the working photo editors today in New York City. Um, and the magazine itself has been recognized with so many awards for its journalism and photography, um, including this upcoming Monday, Kathy will be honored as part of the 1619 project team for best online platform and new media by the International Center of Photography in their Infinity Awards. Of course, that piece also won the, uh, the author, Hannah, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, was also the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for that. Um, and I also wanna mention uh, Kathy's own photographic work. Aperture was very pleased to publish Office Romance, uh, which is now sold out. Uh, it's an ongoing personal project photographing her colleagues and most critically the space of the New York Times building. Um, I was also delighted to work with Kathy uh, as part of the Aperture team who put together the New York Times magazine photographs edited by Kathy, which also became an international traveling exhibition. And I'm just gonna mention that um, if you look in the chat below there is a 30 percent off discount for the new york times magazine photographs uh, which is a great collection of stories behind the scenes and i think that's pretty much what we're going to do here today is go ask kathy to take us behind the scenes and kathy has also asked uh one of the photographers who has been really um putting out amazing work philip montgomery so he will be joining us as well but I want to just jump in, Kathy, and ask how you would describe your responsibility in this moment as a photo editor and what it is that you're um, hoping to deliver to the audiences at home. Uh, well, basically, um, we, the decision was made that we would start working from home. Uh, our first day was Friday, March 13th. So, of course, as it is for everybody, it was a brand new thing that just came up so quickly uh, that we had to get used to that. And uh, a day or two before that, Jake Silverstein, the editor in chief, uh, called me and Amy Kellner into his office. And he was basically, this is when we were still in the building, and he started talking about the pandemic and COVID. And he basically said that he felt this was going to be a huge story and that he really wanted the magazine to cover it intensively. In a way, you know, we've never done something like that where week after week we would be covering one subject in many different ways. And he felt one of the ways we could do that that would be very strong would be through photography. So from that moment, we knew that we had a mission to try to um, start generating some photo driven stories as well as assigning the photography that was going to go with uh, written pieces. So it was a big challenge because you know, here we are for all of us, again, almost everything I'm talking about, I feel like we're all so affected by that we are in this story that we're covering, which is just something I think for most of us aren't used to. 
Mm. So we had to deal with the reality of going back uh, all to our various homes and setting up the laptops and everything. To, we, we basically worked through Google Hangouts and then we started brainstorming basically who to call and what kind of things we wanted to be doing. And that's pretty much how we got started was reaching out to some photographers. Uh, I, I'm trying to think what order I should go and maybe what I'll do. Is oh, I mean, it's so multi, the, the angles that have been explored through the magazine have been so amazing, starting from the hospitals in Italy, which we see mm -hmm. this amazing piece by Andrea Frazetta, uh, which was the first, I think, of the special of these issues. Well, um, actually, I realize it's, it was the first of the big photographic approaches. There was one issue before it. The very first one was actually something that uh, the headline had been exposed, afraid, determined, and it was an issue that looked at the workers, the essential workers who had to stay on the job. And at that point, it was right at the beginning when there was a real uh, question, there was a decision that we shouldn't send photographers. People didn't know the risk of uh, exposure at that point and at times we hadn't gotten together our PPE collection which we were working on so that every photographer would be sent the proper protective gear so we actually just had subjects in the, that issue photograph themselves or with art direction from several of the photo editors have their friend photograph them so that was technically the first one but then the uh, the first the very next one was the big uh, photo issue with the photo essay, and in that case, it was Andrea Frazetta's idea. You know, that was the height of the, uh, the the first country that got hit in a big way in Europe, of course, was Italy. And we wanted to do something there. So we reached out to Andrea, who he proposed the idea of doing the healthcare workers at the end of their shifts, because he had already, even at that early point, been seeing and realizing that the exhaustion on the faces, the fact that the masks would leave marks after the long shifts, the protective masks. So we pitched it to Jake who said, yep, absolutely, uh, we're, let's do it. And then Andrea himself arranged to get into, I think it was three hospitals. And you know, he was wearing the PPE and again, all new challenges, because that was a whole new thing. How do you make pictures when you've got all of that on? How do you connect with people? And he basically, uh, had very short time with each of the subjects, you know, very short. So I just, we were blown away, you know, when we got the pictures, the way that he lit them, the, just the positioning of the people and the kind of endless stares in their eyes, it was emotionally, we felt exactly the right kind of photo essay to publish at that time. And then at, at, at a certain point when he was working, a decision was made to have Jason Horowitz, our bureau chief there, do the reporting. So then he followed up and spoke to each of them. And like, even as we look at that spread there and this one, every one of the stories as the stories came in of the individuals were so moving, just the wide range of ages of the subjects and, and uh, the arcs they were at in their career and their feelings. So it was, it was a very, um, it was intense. Cause of course that was all happening just on our end as we're still getting used to the idea of putting out a magazine from afar. I think. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it is that combination of the stories and the images and of course in the, the photographer's own story as well became something that was relayed. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort well, of yeah. aftermath of that? Yep. So pause on this one for a minute before we go into this publication. As we were, after Andrea had sent the first portraits, which we thought were incredible, and we were going into position, laying them out, and figuring out the, the design and um, Gail Bickler, the design director oversaw all of that and the incredible design and everything you're gonna see today along with her, her staff. And um, there was a moment when we thought, and, and uh, I think even Jake thought it'd be really cool if we could see if, if Andrea could now go home with some of the healthcare workers, just do a little kind of documentary photography to supplement this. Hmm. We proposed it to Andrea, and I say we because Amy Kellner produced this. So she had a lot of the day to day, hour to hour, you know, back and forth with Andrea, and I did uh, too. But so we asked if he could do that, and he wrote back the most thoughtful email, and he, and he said, I, I can't. And he said, I can't because both of my parents, who are older, who live in that area near Milan, I'm not sure if it's in Milan or near Milan, are very sick. 
So right as he was finishing the shoot for us, his mother and father became sick and both of them, and he said, I, I need to be with them, of course, 100%, and both of them went into the hospital. And unfortunately, his mother died very shortly thereafter. His father has fully recovered. Thank goodness that's just now happened. And of course, the family's in mourning. So it was, again, a, just an a incredibly difficult moment because here's someone we've worked with Andrea for years. He's like a member of the Times Magazine family. He did an incredible cover story for us a couple of years in the Donakill region for a cover of one of her wages issues. And, and here he now, it just brought it home so close to home that his own family was affected. And then we, we felt it would be good to share his story, his personal story with our readers and went very gently with that because I didn't want to put any pressure on him who know you know whether he would be comfortable and I asked and he said yes he was okay with that and then he sent this just incredibly heartbreaking picture of his mother in the window he would before she got sick he would drop her food off at the doorstep without going in the house because at that point they were social distancing and she looked out the window for what turned out to be the last time oh. so on top of doing these amazing portraits and you know the cover of this issue that's the here when you're looking at uh this Tarashi from Corriere della Sera, the cover issue of that nurse is just amazing. So what you're seeing here is, Andrea just uh, told us on Monday, it just happened, that Corriere della Sera in Italy decided to go back to the each of these nurses, doctors, and uh, custodial people and um, photograph them with their families. Mm. And I just found it so moving. So the story goes on. The story, and that's also, this is just... It's a story that's got, and I like to hear that it's a little more upbeat, you know, instead of seeing them exhausted after these double shifts they're working. And of course, we've now gone on to see it play out all over the world in a big way. The healthcare workers are the heroes. And this was early in that recognition. And Andrea was really, it was an incredible proposal. And he said, they're the heroes on the front line. I want to photograph them. Yeah. I mean, I think that personal story really does underscore the sort of the way in which where the front line is and how the photographers enter into that and respond to what's on the ground and how it, the, the borders are just unclear where it stops and, and where it starts. Um, we're looking now at the cover of um, what I believe was the first of Philip Montgomery's yeah. ongoing series and ongoing shoots. Um, inside yeah. New York City's hospitals. And I think anybody who's in New York, of course, at that time, this really was the first visualization that I was just so immediately impactful and iconic, I think, and um, just stressing again, like the, the sort of war footing or just emergency uh, sirens blaring, it, it put faces and images to it. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your assigning Philip and how this evolved? So in this case, uh, as we started with our coverage right at the beginning, I just thought, you know, this is uh, unusual. We need somebody who's just working for us on a kind of open-ended assignment. It wasn't even a specific assignment at that point, other than to cover the pandemic in New York, in the, which was starting to rapidly look like it was going to be the epicenter, which it became. So I, I uh, spoke to Jake and said, listen, I'd like to have Philip go on assignment for a month, open-ended, but, and uh, Jake said yes immediately because, you know, we just feel Philip's an extraordinary photographer, a great photojournalist, but also brings incredible sensitivity to his work. Uh, I was anticipating this was going to be difficult in terms of access, and we'll get to that in a second. So then he joined us then to start working every day, whatever we would need related to the coverage in New York. And um, some of it would be stories where we'd be assigning him uh, to shoot something. But then immediately we also felt like it would be absolutely incredible if we could get him access inside the hospitals, which sounds like, oh, it'll be easy, but it's not so easy. And because uh, there's so many privacy issues. And um, Shannon Simon joined our staff on a freelance basis throughout this period to assist us is uh, probably a lot of people on this hangout, but of people know um, Jessica Dimson, the deputy director of photography is on maternity leave, which happened she really right as this all began. 
And um, Stacy Baker left the magazine to join Apple on the West Coast, right as this all began. So I was very glad Shannon uh, came on board with us. And then uh, she started working to get the access to get Philip into hospitals and pretty quickly got the New York City public hospital system. I think it's the only big public hospital system in the country, there are 11 hospitals. She got us a green light to go in, which was not... Uh, how do I say, when you get a green light, it doesn't mean the door, open the doors and you're in. So it was complicated. It was lots and lots of calls. Anyway, that's, I don't know how behind, you know, behind the scenes you want. So the, we were very rapidly pushing. And, and in the meantime, Philip was photographing scenes around New York, important scenes like the white tent hospital that went up in Central Park and the, the big Navy ship coming in and Cuomo and the Javits Center, all these kind of things that we could see publicly, which were important, but we really wanted to get him in to photograph something uh, really inside. So then uh, we got the go ahead and uh, Jake assigned Jonathan Mahler, great magazine writer who has a vast knowledge of the history of New York City and the public hospital system. So he started the reporting for the text that would go with it. And uh, Philip was outfitted with all the PPE and the gear, but clearly he took enormous personal risk. I mean, you cannot overstate this, that by going in there, he was going to be at the same risk as the doctors, but again, taking every precaution uh, possible to protect himself, including uh, Cass Spengler, his girlfriend, uh, they lived together, basically left for the duration of, of this assignment, realizing that Philip uh, was going to be exposed and not, not able to quarantine at that point because he was still working. I just think they're extraordinary pictures. So this is, you know, the first night, he, the first afternoon, he got into Elmhurst, which was, of course, just an incredible scene. And you see here, he, he arranged for uh, a lighting that just heightened things where he, was, he had a plan, both a plan in terms of the uh, challenges of the, what it looks like in hospital, as well as, I mean, just speaking here of the graphic visual power and how to handle very difficult situation. And I just want to say, Trey Cassetta, his assistant, was with him, and we're deeply grateful to him also because every step of the way he was with Philip, and he saw all sorts of things like this that were just harrowing. You know, that's where they turn the patient, the proning that I think we now all know is if you lay on your stomach, it's easier on your lungs. Mm -hmm. We we ultimately got into uh, it was like eight hospitals, technically seven, but one's like a clinic on Staten Island. We wanted to get into all of the boroughs. Uh, it was a lot, there was a lot of stress on it for all the reasons you can imagine, the emotional realities of, of covering. This was, uh, Philip will talk about this. He's actually, as you know, he's here with us. He's going he's gonna to join on after we get towards the end when his, his powerful photo essay that's up this weekend mm -hmm. uh, is up on screen. And here, this was literally somebody who came in who was flatlined. Mm -hmm. And the EMT people did the CPR and, and he came back around, like just stuff that you really have to have presence, nerves, calm nerves. It, it's, it was like war photography in so many ways. And then on the editing side, and you know, and here they have the uh, IV equipment and all outside the room so that one less trip for the healthcare workers to go inside. And we have, you know, the operations team. <laughs> we got amazing stuff working at uh, a very fast clip and, um, then the editing was tricky because we wanted it to be as powerful as possible, but we also not only, we had to stay within the HIPAA rules. Like in other words, you can't just show patients without their permission. Well, there's a built-in challenge on this one because so many of the patients, they're on a ventilator, they're not in any condition to get permission and their family members aren't either because they're not there because they can't be in the hospital. So anyway, just a way of saying this, this was a moment in time where it was extraordinarily difficult emotionally because of the number of deaths that were happening. And then we're, we were on it. We really had determined we would be respectful of people's privacy and dignity, which meant sometimes losing a picture. Yeah, no, I mean, I, when we were discussing this, I mentioned that it, it sounded very similar to issues that I know came up, for example, during the coverage of the Iraq war with Lindsay Adario, really powerful photos that had to be left behind. And again, this this sort of frontline conflict photography 
mentality here in our home, you know, is very, it's very powerful and very effective. I do want to keep moving because I want to get to, to Philip, but I, I think the arc of seeing how the magazine, again, traced through what was happening right here, aptly named, at the epicenter, all of these amazing images giving voice and solidifying what we were hearing about. Again, like I'm, I hadn't been going out and I don't really watch mainline mainstream TV. So to me, this became sort of what I carried in my head for what was going on around us. What I thought was really amazing too, that at the same time, it, you didn't, the magazine chose to also look further afield to sort of bring us back to the global situation. And here we have this amazing story with photographs by Kiana um, Hayeri, who I know that you had been looking and scoping for those larger stories, but tell us how this story came to be and its connection to this larger mapping of what was going, what's going on. So right, uh, right at the beginning again, that second week of March as we, we headed out, uh, Amy Kellner, was in conversation with Kiana. She reached out to her uh, to ask what she was doing. And we thought, because she's an extraordinary photojournalist also, she had just done that photo essay that she had proposed to us of the women in prison in Afghanistan, women who had killed their husbands due to abuse. And we just we were hoping she could do something for us. And that was a moment when there was a lot of uh, talk about the fact that Iran was dealing with tremendous uh, numbers of COVID cases. And it was problematic because a lot of the workers from out of the Afghan workers were leaving the country. Anyway, ultimately, so Kiana had a beautiful proposal, Jake greenlighted it. And in the first thought, as I remember, we were gonna, you, she was gonna do it, something for us in Iran, but that turned out not to be possible. But then she very quickly, really ahead of the pack, realized that tens of thousands of the Afghan workers were crossing the border to go back home to Afghanistan due to the shutdown of the jobs and everything because of the of the pandemic. And she then covered this. So she was there, as you see in that cover picture, that was a whole bunch of the uh, workers coming over the border at a registration center where they had to be tested before going back in. And then she always does a very deep kind of uh, in-depth coverage. When she does these stories, we have big epic scene where you, you know, it's thousands of people, hundreds of people in the picture. She'll also, she then went to find a family and follow them back home and then returned to get them at home in their home village. Uh, so also we just felt like it was a powerful way to speak to the effect of the COVID crisis on a country like Afghanistan that had already, and, and look at this picture. This is the beds that they brought in to start to fill the hospitals when they needed more beds. Like to me, what a picture. They, um, you know, it's every country's facing so many challenges, with this pandemic, but in a place that was already dealing with so much difficulty, like Afghanistan, it just, uh, there was going to be a different set of challenges. And I just think it was an amazing set of pictures. She really is also fearless, had to quarantine for two weeks after doing this story, because it clearly there's just possible exposure to people carrying the virus. Mm -hmm. And then it was out to Afghanistan this week, the news out of the maternity ward, the attack oh, on the maternity ward yeah. is just heartbreaking. No, but I, I mean, I think each of these pieces of this puzzle, again, the sort of the close at home here about prune closing to the, you know, what is happening in countries like Iran and Afghanistan really underscore the global nature of the epidemic. And um, this one as well, you know, it came in right as the statistics were coming out about the um, in the, the, you know, the lack of uh, par parity in the way that healthcare was being um, given and just so many important issues that highlight how the American nature of this extends to everything we know is a problem already in this country. And the, the series of portraits in particular by um, El Casimu Harris, I thought, were so moving and a great echo of the Andrea Frazetta portraits of the health givers as well. Yep, so, yep. And, and this is one where, uh, if you go back to that one for a second, I just want to say a few words about Cousin Harris. We were, we had to do this one 
uh, relatively quickly. Again, we were in through all of this coverage in a kind of uh, high news news breaking mode. And it was a story on the uh, number of people who were dying or members of the social clubs in New Orleans. And he's based in New Orleans. And we, uh, it was an intensive shoot. I think it was like a week of double, double, di double days, day, night, everything, trying to get to the various people. And the, when you see the issue, you, there, there were more portraits, including online. And this was an amazing moment where the funeral, again, for social distancing reasons, the family couldn't gather at the graveside in the way normally would. So the observance was people there out on the lawn of their house. So I just thought that was, and that gave us a powerful opener. We went, uh, the decision was made to go with a type cover on that one, powerful and stark, who lives, who dies, to speak to the larger, uh, the fact this was covering this throughout the country. Not yeah. just ultimately seemed like it made sense. And then here, the following week, this was a cover story on voting during the pandemic and how it's going to affect the voting system and democracy. So again, we didn't go with photojournalism with this one for the cover, but rather a high concept uh, mm -hmm. studio portrait shoot where uh, Gail Bickler and uh, working with Pablo Del Con came up with this concept. And then we had uh, Bobby Doherty uh, shot it, which again, seems like, oh, it's just a picture of a mask, but many, many rounds of just getting like, the tweaking. So it felt almost like the presence of somebody behind it. You know, yeah. I, no, I, mean, I, th I think um, all of these angles, I know in that same issue, there is this piece by Philip Montgomery about the Cullen Lord Community Health Centers mm -hmm. and the LGBTQ community. And again, the sort of fissures within the fabric of American society sort of being so writ large in each of these stories is just sort of so heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. um, and although I want, I don't want to rush through these, I do want to get to this, the next, um, this week's issue because it is, you know, such a impactful um, set of images, and I want, I would love to invite Philip to speak to this, but maybe Kathy, you could just start out with sort of how mm -hmm. you approached this, given that there are so many issues around the ethics, and I was thinking <clears throat> about the piece that Sarah Lewis contributed in the opinion pages of the New York Times magazine, speaking about what, where are all the photographs of those who are dying of COVID, and she had this great line, how images force us to contend with the unspeakable and how they bolster all these statistics that seem to remain so um, abstract without images like this. And I thought maybe both of you could sort of address how, how you approach something so complicated. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, start it off just to place it and then love to hear uh, Philip talk about it. Basically on this one, while he was working in the hospitals, we knew we also that the next step of this story would be to do something on the uh, tremendous uh, number of deaths and mourning and the difficulty of mourning in isolation. So we wanted to be able to show that. And Deb Samuelson, uh, another contributing photo editor on the magazine, started uh, reaching out to funeral parlors in search of one that would be willing to have a photographer to have Philip come in and work on this. And she found this incredible place, the Ferenga brothers in the Bronx, a family business. They've been in business 124 years. And it was the first time they've ever had to turn away clients that the numbers of deaths were so great. But I think from here, Philip, why don't you jump in and tell us about what it was like to, to photograph this? Sure, hi everyone, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I think, you know, on the tail end of photographing the hospitals, we had really, at the magazine, wanted to focus on how to convey the urgency of lives lost in the city. Um, there's a number of ways, I think, photographically, you can begin to start approaching the idea. Um, but I found this is best done, at least in, in, my, in my way of approaching stories, in focusing on a specific narrative thread and going with it. In this case, it was a multi-generational funeral home in the Bronx that had been really largely overwhelmed. Um, and what we found there were, you know, two, two men and their incredible staff who were working tirelessly around the clock, really trying to serve the city and the mourning process. Um, 
it was it was a strange mix of both incredible craft as well as you know heartbreaking scenes from you know overhearing families on speakerphone or you know uh seeing you know and also being being invited largely to some of these funeral services which you know you're seeing on screen right now and i would jump in again and say that one of the things there was the uh the necessity of course of making a deep connection with a particular family and uh starting on the phone that would uh deb Samuelson had real, you know, realized that this family of um, the poor walls, that Mr. Poor Wall there on the cover, were open to being photographed. And then once they met Philip, they totally trusted him and his eye and what he was doing. And then, of course, the same was was true of Sal and Nick Ferenga, the two brothers that owned the funeral parlor. And Philip has such a simpatico nature that I think that even despite the just tremendous sensitivities around this, as you can imagine. Hmm two funeral parlor owners are besieged. They're, they, they've got they, those pictures that you saw of the coffins lined up. In one picture, they're lined up in what's normally a chapel. And then in the other, they're lined up in the showroom. This isn't normal. This isn't what they'd be doing, but they turn up the air conditioner just in no room. And in the picture, the opening picture, or secondary uh, picture that you saw, of, you see Nick taking the body down inside one of those refrigerator trucks. This is tough stuff to photograph. For yeah. You know, go ahead. Philip, I'm sort of just scanning the chats a little bit because I do, I think there are a lot of questions um, just about sort of how how to get in there, but also a lot of people asking about what the lighting situation is. And I know that seems mundane, but there is such a sort of sharp contrast and iconic feel to these. So maybe you could address how you came to that look and what's happening here? I mean, uh, light, you know, light is involved in a lot of my work and I think it became especially important uh, within the hospitals, namely um, the, I mean, to be quite straightforward about it, the, ho the, the light in there is terrible. Um, it's extremely clinical, but in terms of photography, it's, it's, not, it's not great. Um, and I think in order for us, and in order for me, the way that I, the way that I photograph, I, I want to isolate these scenes. Um, and in order to do that, I need to, I need to bring in light. Um, and, you know, this, this sort of lighting setup largely, you know, carried over into the next step of the work, um, you know, for consistency, but also it just, it really helps in the way that I, author each frame um, and, and yeah it's it's more at times it's largely practical as opposed to perhaps aesthetic well that's the sort of the challenge right you're sort of veering from the most mundane and practical to what are here so emotionally compelling results um, right. and <laughs> Sorry, Kathy, did you have a well, I was also going to say even if it was they were practical solutions initially it also helped emotionally. So the picture on the cover of a dead person in a casket, that's a very difficult cover to pull off, right? That's not, it's hard. And I feel like the lighting that gives it an almost celestial quality that part of makes it why people aren't able to look at it with deep sympathy and not somehow be offended like why is on a cover magazine is plain and simply because the sensitivity of the picture and the lighting calls your attention to the ring, the wedding ring on her finger and the gloves, which is marks it as this moment in time when you can only touch your deceased loved one with a gloved hand, but that lighting just, it just makes it feel, I think, more spiritual. And for that, I'm deeply grateful because if you imagine this picture with a different kind of lighting, it, it would actually just maybe be too hard. And instead it's, I feel it's a gentle picture. And we were nervous as we were closing this, of course, many, many discussions and, we tried different things for the cover like we wanted it to be hard hitting and have an impact partly so people will believe all this death and stay home you know mm -hmm. uh, regard the quarantine because there's such a fear that as soon as the warm weather begins everybody's gonna be out and about in new york anyway so i just want to say i feel like that lighting solution and look at the light in this just so spiritual and beautiful and 
almost kind of a religious classical quality. Also yeah. felt the classical quality in Philip's work was evident in the cover picture of the doctor with the patients in the hospitals. It's mm -hmm. like a painting, the whole composition, the whole look of it. And I like that both of these covers feel to me like they harken back to early life magazine. Mm -hmm. That was, that's a good thing, you know, because that's a kind of photojournalism and photography that causes you to stop and look closely. And we need to do that today when there's such an abundance of it on our phones. Mm -hmm. right? And I will say that I will say this, you know, there is there is, you know, there is an idea that this could potentially feel crass, right? The introduction of a light in a moment of mourning or the introduction of a light in a moment of high intensity, uh, you know, movement within an ICU that could feel to the reader as though that is a crass motion on behalf of the author, right, of the photographer. Mm -hmm. However, I'm an extremely sensitive and empathetic person by nature. Um, and I, I, when I introduce the light into that scene, it's either a discussion, you know, with the family. Like, I, I, I brought it up when, I, you know, of course there's calls with family members prior to the funeral. You want to understand who the individual was that, you, that you're photographing, understand the family, speak to them, and really try to listen and, you know, it really just get a handle on, on their story and what they're going through, which can, you know, largely inform the photographs and inform the reporting. But, you know, in the conversation of explaining your purpose is why we're there, uh, you know, I'll, I'll often mention that, you know, this is, this is something that I do, if this is, you know, a concern for your family, this concern for your guys, for you guys, by all means, like, please let me, let me know. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, and it's often the case that, you know, like, you know, the nature of documentary photography, a lot of those, those sort of things fall to the background and the scene just begins to unfold. And, and, and so, um, you know, there's a similar case in the hospitals as well. I mean, for, the healthcare workers, <laughs> you know, they're, they're full throttle. And if at any point we were in their way physically, they were by no means, you know, <laughs> they were not holding back on speaking up, you know? And so if there was a light that was bothering them, trust me, we'd be, we'd be hearing about it. But I think it's, it's, it, 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 it ends up fading to the background in, in, in a lot of these. So. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it is such a balancing act, but each of these images, you know, this has this quality of stillness, the work from this week, the frenetic uh, activity, and yet those moments of pause at the epicenter. Um, it's just been really incredible to sort of experience this, you know, what's going on out there through this work and through the stories that accompany them. Um, I mean, Philip, I, is there anything about any of the other series or sort of being on the ground at this time that has, you think is going to stick with you? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I feel I'm still, I mean, I'm really trying to still unpack it. That's not to say that I'm, you know, having issues with it per se. It's just, it was, it's an enormous situation. Um, I think just as a New Yorker, I think that's what was, I'm still trying to unpack a bit what has happened to our city. And I think what we saw, especially within the hospitals is still, you know, something that I'm trying to unpack that my colleague and assistant Trey is trying to unpack. Mm -hmm. It's just the sheer volume mm -hmm. and the sheer uh, hit that New York has taken and will likely continue to take. It's, um, you know, it's really stuck with me. And as Kathy spoke to earlier, we were, we were, you know, we were, it was a delicate dance as to what we could show the reader and what we were unable to. And that's, you know, that, that has little to do with the hospitals and everything to do with, you know, HIPAA laws. And that in and itself is really challenging, but you also understand it, right? If any of us have a family member that's hospitalized for this, it's, it, you of course you would want you know you'd want to know if a photographer or a reporter was in there poking around right but at the same time the scenes that we were presented with were i mean they were devastating they were shocking we were 
I mean, we came out of there completely rattled. And I think my colleagues that have been doing similar work and could all would all say the same thing. It's yeah. just a different, it's just a different beast. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, at times it was, it was, it was apocalyptic. There were, there were beds on beds on beds on beds on beds. And it, it, it you know, it reminded me of the L train at, you know, nine or 10 in the morning and in the middle of the week, it was just stacked. And again, I, I can't stress enough how much this was not specific to the hospital as much as it was specific to the whole, the entire, you know, scene in New York in terms of the numbers. Um, it, it was in for, for that. I mean, it, yeah, I'm still, I'm still unpacking it a bit. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're all processing it and we're, you know, we have this mediated experience of it. Most of us, if we're lucky, I am curious to ask you how this compares to your experience. I mean, the other really powerful body of work that I, I think you've, one of the ones that you've produced is uh, about the opioid epidemic. And I'm, I'm curious if it seems like they are sort of different parts of the same puzzle or, um, how does it relate to that work? Um, different, different, different beast. But I will say that, and I, you know, I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak on behalf of a number of colleagues who are working on this as well. Is and what I was up against when looking at the opioid epidemic was how do you convey the urgency of the crisis, right? How do you do it? And what is similar with the opioid epidemic was. It was a number, right? It was a statistic. The statistic was opioid overdoses are the largest, are the are the are causing the largest number of death in the United States for Americans under 50. Huge number, right? But what we couldn't, what we weren't effectively doing was visually conveying the urgency of that crisis. And I think how that pertains to the coronavirus is if you're a photographer and you're working on you're, you're interested in, in making photos of that nature. How, how, do you, how do you do that? And how do you make hard hitting pictures if you aren't fortunate enough to have the access that perhaps we did, or we had the resources to, you know, you know uh, reach out to certain hospital executives and, and pound on those doors as, you know, both Kathy and Shannon Simon did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, in that parallel, what what can one do if you are a storyteller, if you are if you are a photojournalist, if you are a documentary photographer that can immediately draw readers to the importance of this of this you know moment? Um, and I think those that's where the parallel is, right? Um, and that's what we're all trying to those of us who are interested in, in making those that type of work, whether you're a writer, whether you're a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, that we're all trying to rack our brains as to, you know, how do, how do we do this and how do we effectively do it hard and fast? So, you know, we can, <laughs> I don't, I'm careful careful these words raise awareness, but in a lot of ways rattle the public, I think at times too, you know, and that's, and that's, that's the, that's the, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, I think at least it was for me is what, what we saw in there was, was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was insane. Yeah. I think if we were able to bring home, you know, uh, <laughs> if folks were able to see that, I think yeah. it, it would change the way that people were moving at the time, you know? Right. The challenge to have impact. Um, well, it's been super impactful for me, and I think many would agree. So thank you so much for joining us, Philip. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Kathy, did you want to? Yeah, just to mention again, like uh, just coming off what Philip was saying at the end, I felt feel like throughout this coverage, we're often walking a fine line between wanting to publish high impact pictures and at the, again, same time respect the the people pictured, and and that's been such an interesting challenge to a greater degree than I I've, I've remembered on something, but but I feel good that we've done it. You know that yeah. The family, one of the daughters of Mr. Porawal, the deceased man in the coffin, sent the most beautiful letter this week, incredible long email to 
Deb Samuelson just basically saying that her family was so honored by it. And it made us feel good because like we had a lot of discussions, you know, and, and Jake to his credit is Jake Silverstein is fearless. You know, he really wants the high impact pictures, but at the same time as journalists, we just wanted, there were a lot of deep ethical concerns. You know, yeah. there were pictures in the embalming scenes that we didn't use because it just, it, it wouldn't have been right. You know, so it just, just another way of saying that, you know, a lot of care goes into walking that fine line. And Philip, I think, is also just incredible at that, that he gets the picture. And at the same time, that people feel a deep faith and trust in him. Yeah. What he's doing. I mean, I do want to encourage people to look at the behind the cover uh, videos that are on the website and I believe on the New York Times Instagram where you're discussing those decisions. And I, I think those are a great look behind the scenes of exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I also just want to say, a mo this is a moment to say what an extraordinary, extraordinary job. Gail Bickler, the design director, and Ben Granjanet, the art director, and, and Kate LaRue, our digital designer, that they are, and the rest of their team that they're doing. It's just amazing. Under enormous pressure, all of these beautiful uh, spreads you're seeing were designed by her team, and it's I'm just uh, amazed by it. And um, really, truly uh, remarkable work. And really pivoting from the classic more restrained treatment when that's what the photojournalistic essays call for, or the sort of uh, much more, um, what would you call it, sort of uh, high concept, high design, you know, uh, big yeah, design. No, it's, and, it's a very pure experience of the images, the words, it's like, yeah. and it's great to see them here in the print uh, version. We're looking at something that I know has just been released online, but won't be seen in print, I don't think, until... Sunday. Uh, next Sunday. Next Sunday. Next and Sunday, so... Yeah, this is an unusual situation. We, um, we, close, we always have to go on press. We close the Friday night a full week before we come out. So I think people often forget that, so we have to go on press a full week before because we're a reviewer of reproduction. And the issue that we closed last night, I think I can say it now, is basically you know, what we learned in quarantine. And it's something we started working on many weeks ago, really at the beginning of all this. And this is uh, really the, uh, like an art issue, very literary. So literary writers and artists and, and Gail uh, just oversaw this in a way, it's incredible when you see it. You're just, I can't tell you too much because it's not out. It is a beautiful issue. You have to get it in, in paper in the same way. I hope this weekend everyone will go and buy the issue with Philip's photo essay on the funerals. And, uh, but one of the things we do now occasionally is release, if we have a special issue, like we do next Sunday, it, we release certain stories earlier because you get more, more traction on, on, on the web. Like more people will see the stories mm -hmm. if some of them go out individually than if you put the entire issue out at once. Okay, so that's just inside baseball. And, uh, I just thought it was great to have this. It just went up this morning. Paolo Pellegrin is one of the contributors in this issue. And at the beginning, I reached out to him to see what he was doing in quarantine. This again, end of March. And not, with, not really at that point, not sure how we could use it. And he just, it's fabulous. As you know, he's been a photojournalist for almost 30 years in many, many conflict zones, war zones, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, Darfur. He's covered Bosnia just many of the hot spots throughout the years. And he never turned the camera on his own family other than snapshots. Mm -hmm. And he decided this time at the beginning of the quarantine, they're based in Geneva, and to rent an Airbnb place deep in the countryside there up in the mountains and to photograph his family as a subject. And they're just exquisitely beautiful. And I feel something that's gonna make readers feel good. You know, we've just had so much grief and so much mourning. So here you're seeing, again, the print, the beautifully designed print layouts. Uh, Caleb Bennett uh, designed these. And, uh, it's, and, and Kate LaRue uh, did the digital. I just love them. So I thought it would be nice to bring them in. And, and I, again, urge you to keep an eye out on everything else that's going to be coming up from that issue and to get it in print, too. Because one worry I have with this quarantine is we've now done eight issues covering this so far. And I just worry that people aren't getting the print version. And I'm just old school enough. I like to hold it in my hands as much as see it, you know, online. So there's a way at least to get to see the print treatment as well as you can all see. I urge you to go and look at the digital treatment, which in many cases has more images and it's designed differently to accommodate the mobile device or to accommodate the desktop. So 
big part of what we do is pivot between those three. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this as we've been talking because you have been careful to mention that this one was in print, this image was in print, this one is only online. I know that you've also been um, doing some really interesting things with the print magazine, including special broadsheets that have been, have gone out. And although I, I think we're getting to the close, uh, to the end of our hour here, we can just maybe quickly, this kind of underscores again, the beauty of the printed page and image. I mean, this is sort of a meta view of that, but tell us a little bit, just a tiny bit about this one. This is, so we have a, a, an offshoot, a part of the magazine is NYT Mag Labs, and Caitlin Roper is the editor who oversees that, along with Jake Silverstein, of course. And that's when we do a number of those special broadsheet sections, not all, but occasional ones are produced by the, by the magazine. And this was one that's just dear to our hearts, at least, oh God, it's gotta be six or seven years ago now. Uh, Chris Payne, Christopher Payne, uh, reached out to me, you know, he's a great, great architectural photographer to say he really, really wanted to get into New York Times printing plant to document it because he's drawn to this kind of extraordinary manufacturing. It's so visual. And uh, it took us a while to get access to the New York Times printing plant, harder than, than many things. But we ultimately did. And once they met Chris, he went repeatedly on his own. So he just wanted to do this as a project, as an artist. And I just felt all along, if there's one person you'd want to document it for history, including New York Times history, he, he's the man. So he was kind of doing his thing over a long period of time. And then at a certain point he came and he said, I've got the pictures, or he wasn't done done, but uh, had critical mass. And he showed them to me and I showed them to Jake and to Caitlin. And, and we ultimately did this beautiful uh, special section. Deb Bishop's the designer, that, that the top designer that does this with uh, others on her team and with Gail. And uh, I just love it. And, and yeah. if, and it's history. And now there, there are big framed prints of it hanging up at the New York Times building that we hope to return to soon. I, and time. I think, I mean, this was an amazing one. Of course, the 1619 oh. project, you know, not enough can be said about how critical this was. This is, um, I think, an interesting way of also just returning to you as a photographer. This was uh, the portrait page of the contributors who um, made the 1619 project so compelling and incredible. Um, and so maybe that's a good place to wrap up just because I know that we are getting, getting to the end. Maybe the last thing I would ask you, Kathy, is just because you do have such an intense romance, literally with the, uh, the office space, the office romance project being your own personal homage to what happens in the space and the offices. Um, I would encourage anybody who has not seen the 1619 project, which is so in depth to please go online and keep revisiting it. I keep finding more and more uh, to discover in these pages and in the content. There's a beautiful portfolio in it by Jenaba Adwayam who did an incredible portfolio for it. Yes, please. I feel like I hope sometime you could do a Zoom like this with some of the uh, staff that worked on this closely too, just because it's, there's so many interesting things. It's an extraordinary project. No, it's a great, that's, that's a very good idea. And there's so much to be said about this and to celebrate about it. Um, I think it's a legacy that's going to keep delivering, you yeah. know, lessons. There's going to be a series of books that are underway. Uh, it, it, there's a, a teacher's curriculum that's uh, gone out to many, many schools. There are many offshoots. This is just the beginning. It's truly mm -hmm. been the biggest thing I've seen at the magazine, just in terms of its power and importance and reach. And many, again, it's, it, this is this is the beginning of it. Uh, and uh, you can still, I think, get the section there periodically, or I don't know where it stands now. Uh, it's been reprinted. There was such a demand at one point it was announced that we'd be giving them out at the time. This was weeks after it came out and there was a huge line. Never seen that. Just to get the printed uh, issues, which is just yeah. incredible. Incredible. I, like I mean, it's an incredible document. And again, just the depth of it and the, the layers, which I think is one of the things that this combination, very, I think, unique 
that magazines give this type of space anymore to this in-depth interplay between the images and the research and the writing. Um, so I think maybe we'll just sort of ask you to uh, maybe just address what it feels like to not be in this beautiful space, which you love and working at home. It's been tough. That's been tough. Um, <laughs> It's, that's been, I, I, it's been really hard. You know, I love working at the office. I miss the people so much. I miss the interaction. You know, magazine making is a deeply collaborative business. Uh, even though we're with each other all day long on Google Hangouts, it's just not the same. So it's, it's been hard. We don't, you don't have that give and take. You know, we used to, you know, when you had a bunch of different covers or options for the opener, we'd spread them on a table and we'd be in the art department with Jake and Gail and everybody and mixing them up and trying different things. And it's all, it's just harder from afar. And, and I miss, I miss my building. You know, I just, I have spent, as you know, many hours making kind of lonely pictures there, you know, in the morning, I'd go in early to catch that early morning Eastern light and Sometimes end of day, I just stay late till the sun went down and go upstairs like in the summer when it's a longer day. And look at that, that's when we densified. That was the rows of chairs being decommissioned. Um, there were incredible surreal things that happened in the building, that's Gail. You know, and the pictures I make are often kind of contemplative. Those are fingerprints on a screen in the early morning, the lights bouncing off particles of dust. That was on a weekend. I often go in on the weekend and I just wander around a couple hours, or I did. That's Matt Willey, that's uh, just magazines. Like it's so much beauty and I just love the fact that most people would think there's nothing to be shot in an office other than great Lars Thunborg, who of course died a couple years ago and did the extraordinary work in offices. He's kind of like my mental, you know, spirit guide to things like, I, I just, newspapers, I just love it all. This is looking down on 40th Street. So. You know, I, I'm eager to get back there and it's not going to be till after September. September 8th is the earliest. Mm. Of course, none of us know this thing keeps evolving. But there's, mm. a, there's a beauty to a deep beauty all because of the light. Renzo Piano is like a photographer. It's all about light for him. And once I, and it, the windows are clear glass. So the clear glass enables the light to that sharp Manhattan light comes powering in. And just neat things happen because of the white ceramic rods that she's the building on and I just yeah. it was you said it's like an elegy so it's kind of weird because there I was that's Jessica Dimson and just I love the softness of it and that was I think one morning we had both arrived a little bit early I'm like hey you want to go do a quick picture mm -hmm. we're all iPhone and what I love about the iPhone is somebody like me who doesn't have much time to spare you can go and do something Wesley Morris was there on a weekend I just started to photograph his hand yeah. that was on a fourth of July I was out relaxing yeah. I just thought I got to get up to the building. It's going to be empty and something beautiful will be happening. Well, I look forward to you getting back there, but I really thank you for the keeping the work going, even from further afield from your home. It, I think it's so important to have had this stream of images and writing from the magazine to sort of ground us in what's going on out there. Um, really appreciate it. No, thank you for doing this talk. It's a chance to really salute uh, incredible photographers like Philip and Kiana and Andrea and just amazing work in Cosimo that people have been doing. So we're grateful for that and more to come. Yeah. We're in well, it, we're you. all still in it. Thank you to everybody for uh, joining us here this evening. It's always nice when we finish these and you sort of see the yeah. many people from somebody, Ethiopia, Indonesia, London. Um, thank you. Really appreciate your attention. Have a good day, evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. Bye, thank everyone. You.